All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, today we're going to uh, go over a couple things uh, really quickly from a webinar that I sat in on um, last night with Trevor Packer uh, from the College Board, um, as well as go over um, the rest of the map uh, projection things from Unit 1. Um, I do want to go over very quickly um, your final assignment that you will have for the year um, in here, which is going to be on Monday of next week. Um, if you are taking the AP test, you will be required on Monday um, when the College Board sends you out your um, practice test link to go out there and take that practice test. Um, it will not be an actual question that you have to answer or anything like that. It'll take you literally two or three minutes. What they're trying to do is make sure that you can access the site, that you can do what you're going to do the day of the test. So copy and paste whatever you're writing, uh, paste it into the document. If you're going to handwrite, upload pictures, things like that, um, that you can actually do that, that you can access the tickets, all of that stuff. So they're basically running through on Monday, May 4th, um, kind of a, they'll send out an email. They'll also post it to your AP Classroom account um, and ac access to the practice test. So I'm um, going we'll to go over a couple things with that here in a second from the notes from last night. But um, on Monday, you will be required to do that. Just take a picture of the screen while you're doing it and send that to me in an email just so I can I know that you have done that. So um, the last thing I want is the day of the test for people to realize that they can't access the test. So I want to go over a couple things. Some of these are, are new things that I did not discuss with you the other day when we walked through the test. Um, there were a couple things they mentioned last night that actually surprised me. So I want to make sure that you have, it, have as much accurate information as possible uh, before we get through this. Um, so the first thing, um, if you are handwriting your test, um, obviously that is not my recommendation. Um, I would recommend everyone to open up um, two windows. You can split screen your iPad. You can uh, have two tabs, whatever you want to do, um, and type it and then just copy and paste into um, the thing that they have set up for you. You obviously can handwrite your answers if you would like. Um, the problem is if you're doing that, then that's going to cut into a little bit of your time. Because if you handwrite it, you're going to have to take a picture of each page. You're going to have to email that to yourself. You're going to have to download those to your computer um, and then you're gonna have to upload those to their site which which will take a lot longer than obviously just copying and pasting from Word or from Google Docs or whatever the case may be that you decide to use so um, you can do anything that you want um, my suggestion would be would be to not handwrite it um, if you handwrite it single space double space they said completely up to you it doesn't matter um, you can do whatever you want. Obviously, if you're just cutting and pasting, it's going to cut and paste everything in single space. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, you will receive a separate e-ticket for every single AP test that you're planning to take. So if you're taking three or four AP tests, I know some of you are taking three AP tests for me. Um, if you're taking three or four AP tests, you will get three or four tickets from them. Each ticket links to a specific test, and each ticket links specifically to you. So let's say person A gets their ticket, they can log in, everything's good. Their friend can't get onto the test, didn't get a ticket, didn't do anything I asked him to do, and they say, hey, forward me your ticket. That ticket will not work for the second person. It is, it is specifically linked to you and will not work for anybody else. Now, the second thing that they said last night, and I was very surprised by this, though I'm, I, now that I think about it, I'm not terribly surprised, I guess. If you forward the email that you receive with your ticket, your test will be voided. Um, their idea behind that is they want to make sure that nobody's taking your test for you. Um, so if you forward that, if you forward that email, even if you forward it to yourself, um, they're probably going to void your test. And the reason why they're doing this is for exam security. Um, when you log in to take your test, they're going to have you answer a bunch of security questions to make sure that you are who you say you are. And those were those are questions that, that were um, things that you have entered on, on your ACT or other things you've done through the College Board in the past, as well as information about you that they got from Northmont when you registered. Um, so there will be questions about you that you will need to answer before you can start your test. So since your test starts at 4 p.m., if you log on at 3.58, and you put in your AP ID and you put in your uh, birth date and all this stuff. And then they start asking you all these security questions. The test is going to start at four o'clock. And if you're still entering security questions when the test starts, you're not going to get as much time to answer your test questions. So please log on before four o'clock 
um, to make sure that you have time to answer all of that stuff before the test gets started. The test, you will be able to access it at 3.30 on test day. I would strongly recommend that everybody get on at 3.30 answer, log in, make sure you can get logged in, answer the security questions, and then the test will start at four o'clock. It'll have a little countdown thing. Uh, please set, change the settings on your iPad so that your iPad doesn't time out if you're sitting there for two or three minutes waiting for it. Um, I don't know what that would do. I don't think it would kick you out, but just I just wanna make sure. So just change the settings on your iPad so you're good there. But, but moral of the story, do not forward that email. The email that is sent to you, it has a it has something embedded in the email um, that if you forward that email, even if it's to yourself, if you forward it to your parents so that you can use their computer, um, don't do it because just go over, go to a different computer, op, log into your email, do what you need to do. Do not forward that email. I cannot stress that enough. They have also said that there will be at times, and it, it's the, the webinar I was on last night covered all of the social studies AP tests, so there's like nine of those. So um, I don't know if they're specifically talking about this one, but I think they might be because of that practice test, that, that question we did the other day. If you remember that question I walked through with you the other day, it had seven parts to it. And seven parts seems like a lot of questions to try to get through, particularly in either, whether it's 25 minutes or 15 minutes, depending upon which of the two questions we're looking at here. They said last night that what they've tried to do is stuff as much material on this test as possible to give you as many opportunities to demonstrate knowledge. So let's say there's seven parts to a question and you have 25 minutes to answer it and you start answering questions and, you're, and you realize very quickly, I'm not gonna be able to answer all of these thoroughly. But what they've said to do is to focus on the ones that you know well so that you can explain those things in as much detail as possible. I'm not saying not to answer the other ones, but if you wanna just give one or two sentence answers for things that you don't know as well and really stress the things that you do know well, that sounds like the best option. What they said on their conference call last night is that the typical AP test you would take, particularly in this class, um, allows you to miss quite a few questions. On the, on the multiple choice questions, you could, you could miss numerous questions before, and if you got a 75% or something on the free response, you would still get a five. Well, here what they've tried to set it up is they've tried to cram a bunch of information onto this test such that you can um, have as many opportunities as possible to show that they, they that you've learned something. But if you don't know one topic or one answer, it's not gonna kill you. They said it is possible to get a five and leave a question blank um, on one of the extended responses. So I would expect the extended responses to have five or six parts each. Um, and I, obviously you're gonna have to use your time wisely. Again, the more that you're trying to look up, Googling online, things like that, the more it's eating into your time. So going into this test prepared is going to be your best option. Obviously um, you will get no new assignments um, after Tuesday of next week from any of your classes. So you will have plenty of time to study for this um, before um, Tuesday the 12th when you'll be taking this. Um, other things that they talked about last night, um, you will be asked to analyze charts and graphs. You will not ask to, be, to create any or anything like that, um, but you would, you should expect at least one question where you're asked to analyze some sort of map or graph or chart or something like that, like they, like they normally do on these tests. Um, they said to please stress that if students are using Word or um, something that doesn't save automatically, like Google Docs, to save your work periodically, um, you if you experience some sort of catastrophic, like say we have a thunderstorm that day and you lose power in your house or your modem goes out, or something like that, you can apply for some sort of test. Um, you can you can apply. They have to approve it, but you can apply to be able to do to retest on the on the makeup date. Um, however, if you just forget to save and you lose your document because you accidentally X out of Word or something like that, then they're probably going to tell you you're out of luck. So, um, and if you're the only one who lost power and everyone at Northmont didn't lose power because you're making that, that answer up, they're probably not going to uh, give you permission to retake the test. So again, save often. Um, if you're in using Google Docs, which is why I suggest you do that, it will save automatically for you. Um, you can keep two windows open there. Um, Another reason I'm discouraging students from handwriting things, they said last night that if you um, are handwriting and you say you want to attach three pages for that question, um, you've taken three pictures, you attach the first one, then you accidentally hit the submit button before you before you attach the second page, you're out of luck. You're, they're not going to allow you to go back in and um, attach additional pages. Even if you email the college board immediately, they're not going to take it. So it's something that if you... Obviously, you're, you're not gonna do that if you're just copying and pasting from 
um, Google Docs into the, into the document. So again, that is my strong suggestion. Um, obviously, if you want to handwrite, you can, um, but just realize that could be cutting into the amount of time that you have to write, and it's also going to make it a little it make you more prone to making some sort of mistake where you accidentally hit the submit button too early. Um, you will not use you will not need the lockdown browser for this test. I know some of you who are in my econ class have struggled with the lockdown browser. You will not need that for this test. Um, big thing here. Um, Obviously, the school iPads, this is not giving me an issue with those because that, that does not have this. But if you're using a computer that has Grammarly, um, Grammarly has a plugin um, that they have um, that you can download. If your computer has a Grammarly plugin um, on it, um, and, you can, and you can test this with the practice test on Monday of next week, which is why we're doing this, um, your test will not load. The test is set up where it's, and this is mainly for the language arts tests, um, but your test will not load if there's a Grammarly plugin installed on your browser. So um, if you have that, you can disable that in advance. So you can do that. If you're using a school provided device, the, it, there is no Grammarly plugin on those. But if you're using a computer at your house, you use Grammarly, you've installed that, you're gonna need to uninstall that before you take the test. So that is something that they stressed last night. Um, last thing that they stressed last night was um, <clears throat> your devices, um, your, and any notes that you're using, they've set up a site called, uh, it's, it's cb.org slash AP Open Book Tips um, to kind of tell you, obviously you can use your notes, you can use your book, you can use resources like that if you need to. They kind of go over what's what the expectations are in terms of things being your own words. So um, again, if you're just copying definitions from the book for something and you're using the same words as somebody else, they're gonna get you for plagiarism. So um, make sure that you're putting things into your own words, all of the work needs to be your own um, and they're really really stressing that um, really hard this year um, so I think that was all of the new material from last night um, if you have any questions about any of that please send me an email um, the other thing that they said is that if you um, have some sort of conflict with the test date so on the 12th you cannot take the test that day um, you don't click on the link that they send you for your test. So uh, don't open that email. Um, you'll need to email the college board, let them know I need to take the test on the makeup date. They will send you a new ticket for that date if there's a legitimate reason why you can't test on the 12th. Um, if you open that email though, and you click on that, that ticket, then that's it. You, 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 you forfeit the opportunity to have any sort of makeup uh, barring some sort of catastrophic thing that happens like a power outage or something uh, during your test. Um, so if that were to happen, if you were to have some sort of catastrophic thing happen, we have a storm that day, there's a power outage, something like that, don't panic. You have two days in which to contact the college board to let them know. Uh, please contact me as well. Let me know what's going on. Chances are if one of you loses power, multiple ones of you will lose power. So it's not going to be something where it's going to be one person. Uh, chances are, obviously it could be, but um, chances are that's not going to happen. So um, just let me know if you have questions about any, any of that stuff that I just went over there. Hey, all right, I wanna go over a couple things real quick today. I just wanna kind of finish up our unit one review. Uh, and I wanna do types of maps first. And, and, and th there's actually a, a Quizlet out here that has this, which is why I pulled this up today, which is um, a really good Quizlet because it's got all of these on there. It actually has probably, it's got, this is an older Quizlet. So there's three of these that I, the chances are they're not gonna ask you about on the AP test, but I'm just gonna briefly review these really quick uh, just so you have this. So a reference map, Okay, is any map that shows information about a particular place for the purposes of navigation. So if you think of any regular map that you would look at, if you're looking at an old school map that's printed, that's got highways and things like that on it, that's a reference map. It shows you how to get from point A to point B. This is just a standard map that a normal person would think about when they're thinking about what a map actually is. So if you hear the term reference map, it's just a map like we would think of off the top of our head. Topographic maps. This is the kind. This is the thing we talked about um, a little bit yesterday. These are maps that use what we call ISO lines to represent elevation changes. So it might be something where I'm drawing things where I have a bunch of squiggly lines that are going to impact. Uh, 
they're going to suggest that this is at a higher altitude than something else. An ISO line is just any sort of line on a graph that's that's meant to connect things that are similar to each other. So if I look at the Great Plains, obviously they're going to be generally the same elevation. So I might have an ISO line that goes down the map there because everything suggests that they're the same same um, elevation there. Um, when I get up to the Rocky Mountains, I might have a lot of those things together to suggest that that's a higher elevation. There's more things kind of packed together. So if you hear a topographic map, okay, it's going to be little things like this that kind of show, and you can see this when you're looking at it. You can look at this map, the darker areas where there's a lot of lines crammed in there, there are be places that are higher elevations. Um, those are things that are easier to see. So that's, a, that's what we call a topographic map. Um, those are generally used to show elevation. Uh, physical maps are very similar to that, okay? But physical maps are meant to not just to show mountains and elevations, but they're also meant to show where the plains are, where deserts are, things that rel related to terrain or anything like that, okay? So this would be an example of that. So this would be a physical map that kind of shows you, you can easily look at this map and see the green areas are, are plains and grasslands, uh, the browner areas are the mountains there, things like that. So it shows, gives you information that shows you the differences there um, in, in different landforms that you would expect to see there. So that would be a physical map. It's what you would see in an atlas. Sometimes that they're, these are called atlas maps, but generally what our book talk, when our book talked about it, they called these physical maps. Okay. Uh, fourth one is a political map. The whole point of a political map is just to show you boundaries. So this would be a map of the United States. The colors don't mean anything. The colors are just there just to show you the boundaries of states. You could have a, a map of Ohio that shows you the different counties, um, and that would be a um, that would also be um, a political map. But if it's showing you just boundaries and things like that, that's a that's a map that's political. Okay. All right. Thematic map is one that we didn't really talk about a whole lot this year. Um, a thematic map is anything that really shows variables. So like, let's say I want to show a map of uh, population, and I want the states that are um, darker to be um, states that have higher population. So I might have a bunch of different shades of colors, and the darker the color, the um, higher the population is uh, within those areas. So that, that would be an example of... Um, of uh, thematic map. Generally, you could see these in a lot of different areas. So this could be something where um, you could use these to show income distribution. You could use it to show uh, percent minority population, things like that from low to high, or you're using a bunch of different colors to represent things like that. So that would be a thematic map. Um, again, chances are you're not going to see this on the test, but it's, um, it is something that, that um, you should probably be aware of. Okay, uh, number six is a chloropleth map. And this is the one I mentioned yesterday that was in one of those um, questions. This is very similar to a thematic map um, in that it uses tones or colors. Uh, but what we're really looking at here is we're, we're lo really looking at average values per unit data. So if you look at a map here, this is really gonna be used to show percentages and you're usually only gonna have maybe a couple different colors, something like that, where you're really just trying to stress. A thematic map is very similar to this. So this is why thematic maps aren't really referenced much on the AP test, um, where this is really focused on a lot more. So if you see a map like this, this is a chloropleth map. Map, and it's going to stress areas that are that are higher in whatever they happen to be looking at as a darker color, lower as a as a as, a, as in this case a lighter color. But it can be anything, um, any type. And these again, these maps are very similar to each other. Um, the, thematic maps, okay, chloropleth maps, and you can see in the definition of a chloropleth map, it says that it, it is a thematic map that uses tones or colors. So um, if you see that on the test. This is one that I wouldn't be shocked if they reference because this is the type of map that they will probably give you as your um, stimulus for a question. They'll ask you to look at this map and draw conclusions from it. Again, remember, this is a uh, AP class that a lot of freshmen take, so the conclusions that they ask you to draw from these maps probably aren't gonna be rocket science. Um, so this is something that, um, again, this is the type of map they would ask you to look at there. Um, dot maps are exactly what they sound like. Okay, I'm gonna put a bunch of dots to represent um, certain instances of things. So this would be, uh, this map here looks at farm density around the United States. So there's a dot for every farm. So you can obviously see the Great Plains, Upper Midwest, there have a lot of them. Rocky Mountain areas don't. So that's just a, a dot map, or sometimes you'll, you'll see that called a dot density map. Um, ex exactly the same thing. So um, you can expect to see um, something like that. That could be another one that they could give you there. Um, 
Graduated symbol map is not something that I really see on the AP test anymore. Um, this is basically symbols of different sizes um, that represent the amount of something in a state. Um, I'm going to show you a cardigram here in a second, which is another one of these. This is much more what we see today, particularly for the purposes of the AP test, is that they will show you cardigrams where one state will be huge to represent that they have a lot of whatever that thing happens to be that they're looking at in that in that instance. So this is a, what they call a graduated symbol map. I would be absolutely shocked if this was on the test so um, this is something that that was a lot older in terms of the older older curriculum um, well now it's gonna freeze up on me uh, all right I'll just go through the other two that were the other three that were on here um, the, the next one was a uh, was a cartogram which is the one that um, we we already talked about so basically um, if you have um, India and it's the largest country in the world um, in terms of population, then it's going to be um, the largest country on that map. So that would be um, that would be something that you would expect to see um, India, China um, be really huge on that map. Um, other countries that are a lot bigger um, but don't have a large population, you would expect to see them be a lot smaller on a map like that. So that would be a cartogram. Um, the other two that they had on here. Um, one is called an ISO line map. This is another one where I don't really see um, them putting this on there. This is more of what you would see if you watch for like, if you ever watch the weather and they have like um, certain parts of the country are uh, darker, like a, a red because it's 90 or to 100 degrees in that area. And they use kind of like little squiggly lines on the map to kind of encircle an area where it's, it's 90 to 100 degrees. That would be an ISO line map. They might have a different color with kind of encircled in lines that's um, that would be 80 to 90. 90 or something like that. So that would be an ISO line map. Chances are you probably won't see that on the test. Um, and then the last one's called a flow map. Um, a flow map is, is exactly what it sounds like. It shows you the movement of things from one per one place to another. We looked at a lot of these throughout the year without really calling it that. That If you look at the movement of, let's say, refugees from the Middle East up to Germany, something like that, and they have an arrow that connects Syria with Germany, that's a flow map. It's showing you movement of people. So if I drive a, a, of a big arrow that shows Mexico into the United States and I have a smaller arrow that shows Canada into the United States, that would represent that there's there's more people flowing from Mexico into the U.S. than there are flowing from Canada into the United States. So that would be a flow map. So those are the different types of maps. I know I had a couple of you emailed me um, and asked me to kind of review that because there was the one question about the chloropleth map that was on the Unit 1 review um, that, that some people were concerned about uh, because they had they had they didn't remember that term from before. Um, okay, um, I want to go over the map projections really quickly. Um, and this will be the kind of last thing we go over today. Um, this is basically summarizing the end of Unit 1. So anything else in Unit 1, um, if you have any specific questions over it, let me know. I'm going to start with the three that our book talks about. And then I'm going to go to a couple of the other ones that are not in our book. Um, the Mercator projection is probably the most common projection that you're going to see. So Mercator projection is this one. That, that looks here very clearly, very accurately shows the shape of our continents and it shows the direction of continents, which is why Antarctica is so huge. If I could, because if I go south from South America or Africa or Australia, I hit Antarctica um, because of the, of the shape of the globe. So the, the only way I can really represent that in map form on a flat map is to show Antarctica be really, really large. Um, the obviously obvious weakness of this map is it greatly distorts the size of land masses, particularly near the poles. If you look at the distance between um, our lines here, um, if you look at our lines running up and down, okay, you should know what those are called, um, you'll see that they're pretty equally spaced. But if you look at our lines running parallel um, to the equator, you should also know what those are called, um, you will see that there's a lot bigger gap up at the poles, okay, than what you see when you're down in the middle of the map. So we have a lot of polar projections um, in our Mercator projections. Uh, so that's that's the big weakness of the Mercator projection. Um, we also have the, what's called the good homolysine projection. Um, this is the one, um, the kind of the, the weird looking map that we that we that we looked at. Um, this is um, really good at showing the true size 
of the Earth's land masses um, does a really good job of that, um, particularly in relationship to each other. Um, Antarctica being chopped up into pieces here is representing the fact that Antarctica really isn't that big in the grand scheme of things when you compare it to the way it might be shown in a Mercator projection. So um, this is uh, doing a good job of representing that. The size of the, of the land masses for the most part are pretty good. There are some obvious weaknesses to it. The, the biggest thing being the cut. So if you look at Greenland, Greenland's cut in half. Um, if you look at how far it would be to travel from the United States to Europe, that cut in the map uh, makes it very hard to tell um, how far that, that distance would be. So that's the good Hamalocene projection. That was the second one that our book went over. Um, the third one is what's known as the Robinson projection. Um, with the Robinson projection, what you see is that it does a good job of maintaining overall shapes of things without a ton of extreme distortion. Okay, so you can see that the distortion, there's still some distortion there. And if you look at um, the distance for the lines, again, um, if you're looking at the Mercator projection versus this one, I want you to pay attention to the lines of latitude and longitude and to look and see where those are different um, in terms of distortion. So you can kind of take a look at that um, as, as you review just to make sure that you can see the, those major differences there. So those were the three that our book spent a lot of time on. I do want to talk very briefly about a couple others, and I'm just going to use... Um, uh, Wikipedia for this, just for the purposes of making um, making our lives easier here. Um, if I can get this to come back up. Oh. Try again. There we go. So let me just go to Wikipedia and type in an azimuthal projection. Okay, this is one um, that you should definitely know. Uh, if I can type, that would make my life easier. So azimuthal projection is our polar projections, okay? So looking down at um, the Earth from the poles, um, the, the benefit to a map like this um, is that it shows you the actual proximity from place to place. Now, if I look at um, North America and Europe and Asia on a map, it looks like they're next to each other, and it's really hard to tell that... Um, I can actually fly from Canada to Russia and go over the pole if I wanted to. Um, obviously, there's some length to do, to do that, but it's something that um, is not shown by a typical map that you would be able to see. Um, the map shows true compass directions as it relates to moving from point A to point B. Um, our, launch, our lines of longitude are straight, um, lat lines of latitude are circular, uh, so it's very, very clear there. Um, and the, this, the main distortion is towards the outer edges. So when you get to, get, get to the edges of this map, um, you see that there's a lot more distortion there um, than you would see in other places. So this is um, the azimuthal projection, or a polar projection. You will see that sometimes. Um, the fuller projection, Okay, is all of our chopped up triangles. So we looked at this one a little bit earlier this year. Um, fuller projection. Um, it basically, you're not going to use this at all to show you direction from point A to point B. But this is really looking at each landform in its proper size in relation to other things. So if you look at Antarctica here over on the right, um, you can see the actual size of what Ant Antarctica really is. You're not gonna see that at all in a Robinson projection. You're not gonna see that at all in a Mercator projection um, or anything like that. So those are the projections that um, you would you would use for navigation. This is something that you're gonna look at to actually look at the actual, the, the actual size of each of these um, these things. Now, um, you'll see this sometimes called a Dymaxion map. Um, for the AP test, they're almost certainly going to call it a fuller projection if they happen to reference this at all. Okay. And the last important one is a Robinson projection. Um, this looks very similar to um, the fuller projection in a way. I'm sorry, not the fuller projection, but the, uh, the, Robinson, uh, the Robinson projection. I'm why did I show you Robinson again? It's not where I meant to go. Peter's projection. That's where I meant to go. We already know what the Robinson projection looks like. So Peter's projection hey, has some similarities to some of the other ones. But what you can see here is that basically um, pretty much this is a map that's designed to display the axes very accurately. Okay, But in the process, they've 
severely distorted the shapes, particularly crunching up the North Pole pretty significantly, stretching out the South Pole because they're really focused on the equator. They're really focused on the prime meridian, making sure things around there are accurate. Um, you're not going to be able to navigate by this map as the shapes themselves are not, are not horribly accurate. Um, but it, this is something that... Um, is used in, in, in some forms, but it's not something that's super common that you would expect to see on, on, um, on the AP test. So those are the big six. Um, they're trying to add in or trying to make reference to um, a sinusoidal map projection. Um, this is not something that um, I would expect you to see. Um, this is a new thing that they're trying to stretch, that they're trying to emphasize right now. Um, obviously, this is ridiculously ugly. Um, sinusoidal basically um, basically is trying to represent the equator accurately, and the things right along the equator are projected accurately, maybe 10 degrees, 10, 10 degrees, 20 degrees north and south, but everything else is horribly distorted. So this is a sinusoidal projection, not something I would expect you to see in terms of being asked to identify something like this um, on the AP test. Um, so that's essentially the map projections. Those are the ones you need to know, um, different types of maps. Um, so that's basically our summary of unit one. So we've done unit one. Um, we've also done our cultures. We've talked about religion. We've talked about language. So um, next week, I'm going to go over um, particularly unit two. Um, we talked about demographic transition already, epidemiological transition. I'll do a little bit more review of those units um, on Monday. Monday's video will be very short, so I want to make sure that we leave time on Monday for you to go out and do that practice um, AP uh, access to make sure that you can actually get on there. So um, that'll be the main thing that we will do on Monday. If you have any questions about anything I went over today, particularly relating to the test or anything like that, um, please email me and let me know. Um, I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Um, really glad to see that you guys will get um, a graduation ceremony. I know it's not um, the, the graduation ceremony that we, that we all hope for, but I was really glad that um, Dr. Thomas and Dr. Inkerot were able to um, put something together that will give you the opportunity to, um, to get your diploma at the school and will allow you to walk Thunderbolt Way one last time um, as a student. So um, really, really happy that that happened. Um, Hope you all have a fantastic weekend, and I will talk to you all on Monday.